Fantastic. Well, hello, everybody. My name is Mark Miano. I'm our VP of Sales and Partnerships here at Glue, and just very excited to be running. I've lost count of the amount of webinars that we've now run, and I think that's a good thing because our mission here is every single time that you open up Glue or you've joined us for a demo or a webinar or, what, or whatnot, that you always leave smarter than you walked into the call, right? And that's our mission statement here is to truly um, be your business intelligence partner when it comes to e-commerce and multi-channel. Today, what we're going to be talking about is customer segmentation. Um, actually, not from the standpoint of automations, which a lot of people associate customer segmentation uh, with, but actually, um, I'm, we're good, right? I'm sorry. But actually, from the point of business intelligence. So before we set up all those great automations in Klaviyo or MailChimp or you know whatever you're using uh, to segment out your base uh, before, it's really important that we think critically about how we go about doing this first. Now, I will say this. We have a little bit less time today than I'd like. So if you have any questions, please drop them into the question box. And um, Abby and I, Abby is my VP of marketing, we're going to make sure that we document those questions and answer them all for you. And, um, and, and, and make sure you're taken care of on that front. All right, share screen. I click share. And now share the event. Ah. I'm going to share my application right now. No, I'm going to share my entire screen. It says cancel, Wait, share. How come it's not? Oh, got it. Sorry. All right, we are now sharing. Customer segmentation. All right, the definition, guys the activity of dividing a broad consumer or business market, normally consisting of existing and potential customers, into subgroups of consumers based on some type of shared characteristics. Woo! That's a mouthful. I just like to say treating different people differently is what customer segmentation is, right? Um, someone who is a lady that lives in the beach will be treated a lot differently than a mountain man who lives on, you know, in the woods, obviously. They have different people, different experiences, different tastes, and it's really important that we treat different people differently. This is common knowledge, but like I said before, most people, when they think of customer segmentations, aren't just thinking about anything else but marketing automation. Uh, yes, don't get me wrong, marketing automations are great, and email segments are great, but like I said before, it's really important that we think critically about our business before we jump to that really important step, because once you begin your marketing automation to click that button, and there's really nothing that you can do after you've uh, messaged your clients incorrectly. Real quickly, I think it's important to revisit what I call the triangle. If anyone's ever talked to me on the phone before or over a Zoom or in a person, I always bring up the triangle. One of the biggest differentiators when it comes to segmentation that Glue is going to provide is the ability to use more than just one or two dimensions when going about this exercise, right? In business intelligence, we talk in dimensions. Right now, if you're using something like Klaviyo or, or doing your segmentation manually, you're most likely using the dimensions of finances and time, um, or maybe even just revenue and time. But Glue, what we allow you to do is we allow you to use more than just two dimensions when it comes to uh, cut, uh, slicing and dicing your customer base, right? Uh, the triangle is actually revenue and cost for us. We incorporate both. Time, we're fully historical, and Google Analytics. So I want you to think of this kind of like a Rubik's Cube in the sense that a Rubik's Cube is three-dimensional, right? And we can go ahead and move that Rubik's Cube in thousands and thousands of different directions in order to create thousands and thousands of different customer segments that are personal to your store and your store only. What do I mean by this? Well, I'm in glue.io, and I'm going to come over into customer list. And you'll see here in the 
upper left hand corner, I can click create a segment. And this is what I mean, right? Where I have my customer info and engagement, which is pulled out of the uh, Shopify account or the e-commerce account. Same thing with location. My web activity is pulled out of Google Analytics. And then both. So now I can ask myself, hmm, I wonder, or maybe I want to treat customers who have ordered once with an average order value greater than 100 who live in North Carolina that bought first off of Facebook. Jeez. Number of orders equals one. Average order value is greater than or equal to 100. Let's say they bought first off Facebook. Channel is Facebook. And um, then they live in North Carolina. I totally forgot. City or state is North Carolina, right? That is the triangle. That's what I mean by having those three dimensions and much more power when it comes to uh, going ahead and, and, and cut, slicing and dicing your customer base. What's exciting, and I know I'm breaking my rule here, but when you create segments in Glue, <laughs> we are a great market automation feature too. So they all push over to Klaviyo and MailChimp and soon to be Dot .digital and all the other ESPs that we integrate with. But just note that that's not what we're trying to talk about today. The reason why we're not talking about that today is because of a question like this. Hmm. What if I am the NFL, we do a lot of work for them. I'm the NFL and I, like everyone on this call, only have 24 hours in a day, right? And I need to prioritize which of these 40 different markets I'm gonna concentrate on over others. Well, what I'm first gonna do is I'm gonna come to customer list I'm going to create a segment, number of orders, let's say, is greater than or equal to one. We're down here in North Carolina. So what if I said North uh, state is North Carolina? And I call these Panthers fans. Great. I just segmented out my customer base, and now I can target my Panthers fans with Panthers paraphernalia. But like, I, like the question I just proposed, what if I only have 24 hours in the day and I have to prioritize which of these, you know, 30 to 40 different geographic locations I'm going to concentrate on over others. I'm not going to concentrate on all of them evenly. That makes no sense. Think about this. Tom Brady just won his sixth Super Bowl. How many Super Bowl jerseys does one guy or girl need? Not six. I always joke maybe four, but not six, right? So how are we going to understand how to prioritize which of these different markets to concentrate on with our marketing automations? Well, what I'm going to do is go to customer segments and look at my segments through this view instead, and I'm going to rank my segments in order of lifetime value. And if you need a refresher on LTV, I highly recommend that you go to the Glue Academy video series and watch video two on LTV if, you, if you're a little bit if that's a little bit of a mystery as to why we did that. But when I click into that segment, what you're going to notice is a deep analysis on that segment, right? And let's let the query load for just a moment. The question that I'm going to propose is this. What percentage of my annual revenue is coming from this group of people? I've spoken with many business intelligence professionals in my life, and these guys have been in business for 20 to 30 years, and the first thing that they always provide to their enterprise clients, we're talking like Dick's Sporting Goods, uh, Target, Walmart, major, major enterprises that are paying millions of dollars to these BI shops, the first thing they ask is what percentage of my annual revenue is coming from a very specific group of people? Now. This being my highest LTV segment, let's take a look, VIP customers. Ranking customers by the revenue they have generated, these customers are in the top 10% of my customer base. I can see that 36.6% of my annual revenue is coming from this group of people. Is that good? Hell yeah, it is. Because 30 to 40% of your annual revenue should be coming from the top 10% of your customer base as an e-commerce multi-channel business. If it's lower than that, 
Uh, I work with an air filter company. Uh, 15% of their annual revenue is coming from this group of people. God forbid, or they upsold their client, right? <laughs> it's way cheaper to upsell a current customer than to buy a new one so that they knew all hands were on deck when it comes to retention in the shortest of terms in that scenario. Whereas I work with a very high-end arts and crafts company, 75% of their annual revenue was coming from the top 10% of their customer base. God forbid they lost one of those, you know, one of those customers. They lose a huge chunk of their annual revenue. So here's just two really easy things to think about. And one of them is Facebook lookalike audiences. So I would recommend exporting a CSV file of your highest LTV customers and importing that into Facebook lookalike audiences. And when you're spending that money with Facebook, let Facebook not just find any customer for you, but more of the right customers for you, which is really important. And another, and I think a more powerful way of thinking about your VIPs is I should be able to go up to any VIP customer on the street like a stranger and tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, are you a VIP customer of this merchant? And they should say, heck yeah, I am, because that merchant has communicated that to me. They treat me that way. They've built loyalty with me. The best digital marketing in the world will pale in comparison to the warm leads that your highest paying customers have brought to you on their own, right? Now, real quickly, you'll see the, the ESP function here where I can sync that over to my ESP system real quick for further automations. And the one last thing I'll share with you before we move on to the next segment is going to be the products purchased, right? So not only are we going to have a really great uh, analysis on what percentage of my annual revenue is coming from this group of people, but I'm also going to be able to view what the tastes are of the highest paying customers or, or in this particular case, my VIP customers. That's huge, right? Because knowing what the tastes of my customers, my highest paying customers are further empowers me to bait the proverbial hook, which is your website with the right products to attract the right customer, which in this case is the highest paying customer. Great. Now that's the first end of the bell curve, right? the extreme when it comes to high paying customers. The other end of the bell curve is the value shopper, okay? Value shoppers, customers who have always used a discount code when purchasing, okay? I can see in this particular dummy account that 25% of my annual revenue is coming from this group of people. Cool. Is that good? No, it's not good. Five to 15% of your annual revenue should be coming from people who only buy when there's a discount. Okay. If it's too high, like in this dummy account, well, you might be getting caught in a discount trap where client or customers will hold out on buying from you from full price, expecting to buy at a discount later. We don't want those guys, right? We want people based, people buying based on value. Um, is it too low? What if it was like 0%? Wouldn't that be awesome? No, that wouldn't be awesome. Discounting is an effective strategy, right? As long as the return on that discount is greater than the discount itself. So for example, um, I work with a lot of makeup companies where a makeup company might actually lose money on the first or even the second sale in order to build loyalty with that customer. So the third through the 1000th sale comes automatically and they make a lot of money off of that customer. Also think that when you look in your value shoppers segment, you might have a, I was on a call this morning with a, uh, with like a, uh, a nutrition company that sells like that muscle mix stuff that you like protein powder and stuff that you drink in the gym to get, you know, buff for summertime. And we saw that like 40% of his annual revenue is coming from the value shoppers. And he got a little bit worried, but I was like, Hey, shit, don't, don't worry because, um, he had a, he, uh, like 80% of his clients only bought once for him. What was happening is people were buying once at a discount. He's a very new store. And so 
he knew that his immediate behavior change would be to go to his value shoppers whose orders equals one and to go ahead and try to get those uh, value shoppers who just bought one set of discount to buy again at full price now that they've experienced the product. So something to think about, you know, obviously we don't want to get carried away with discounting, but at the same time, discounting is, is an effective strategy. And if you don't shoot in on, <laughs> right? Like I heard they actually burn their, um, I don't know if this is true or not. They actually burn excess inventory that they don't need um, in order to keep their prices so high. It's kind of crazy, but that's not, you know, that's a very extreme, extreme example. I think one last thing I'd recommend, guys, is when it comes to value shoppers, you're definitely going to want to unload unwanted inventory on these people, right? If you have overstock product or um, low sell-through product, don't discount that on the website generally. Go ahead and send that over to the people who are looking for a bargain to save the full price products for the full price customers, right? Now, I'm going to stop there. There are many segments and infinite amounts of scenarios but we do have about um, a couple minutes left. Like I said, we had to kind of cut this one off a little bit early today. But we'd love to open up for any Q&A by design in order to um, um, help you. Yeah. Yeah, we've got a couple of good questions in here already. Um, and we've got about 10 minutes left. So feel free to post any questions you guys have in the chat or in the questions module. Um, we got one from Derek. He says, we carry team hats. Is there a way to break down on previous hats or teams that they have purchased? So product segments, basically. Yeah. So there is. And unfortunately, it's not in the customer list area. It's a little less intuitive. If you click into the product area and click into a product detail, and I scroll all the way down, there's a CSV file of the customers that bought that product that you can go ahead and export and target. Uh, we, what you're asking for to have customer segments be included in that triangle, it would actually move from a triangle to a square at that point, actually, right? Um, yeah, like, <laughs> right, shapes and, shapes and colors, right? Um, that's called multi-dimensional segmentation way outside the three dimensions and we are aware of that and are scoping out that build but Derek for now you go to glue products list click into the product scroll down and you'll find that CSV file of customers cool great question um, we got another one from rich a good question could a customer be segmented in two categories yes a lot of these segments are not what is called mutually exclusive, meaning a customer can belong to more than one segment at a time. For example, I can be a first purchase customer and a paying customer at the same time. And what we have here at Glue is when you write in and um, work with your rep, we have cadences and structured documentation to help you create your automations in a way that you're not double messaging the same person. But yeah, be careful. That's a good question. Cause like when you're ranking this by revenue, you know, be aware that you know, these segments are not mutually exclusive. But like I said, we have plenty of documentation to help you understand which segments are mutually exclusive. Cool. Two really good questions. We can give it a couple more minutes. If anybody has any more, feel free to post them in the chat. Um, anything else we didn't touch on customer segmentation wise? I think the one thing about customer segmentation guys is I get this question all the time. It's, I get this one question on another webinar. How do I get people who bought once to buy again? And customer segmentation is so important because it allows you to set yourself up for success. My answer to that question is you need to get the right customer, right? Uh, I think I just gave the bikini example where like I bought a bikini for my wife off of bikini.com for reasons I hope I don't have to go into. I am not bikini.com's right customer because I'm a male who lives inland that doesn't wear bikinis. So if you're wondering why I'm not buying from you a second or third time, it's because I'm a dude that doesn't live on the beach. 
So it's really important that you find your chick that lives on the beach, whatever that right customer is for you, and to use these segments in order to attract the right customer, upsell the right customer, while quarantining the customers that are cheap, that aren't the right customer or whatever, so that you're not wasting your valuable time on people that aren't worth it, if that makes sense. Cool, we got two last ones in here that I think we have time for. Um, one's a super simple one. Can you confirm where I can find one-time buyers? Yeah, you'll go into Glue, Customer Segments, and you'll see your first purchasers right here. Um, the video's a little bit lagging, but. Oh, sorry. No, yeah, it's a predefined segment out of the box in glue called first purchase. Yeah, and we can send out, I'll, I'll include kind of step by step instructions in the follow up as well. Um, this is another interesting question too. If you own multiple brands and are looking to expose your customer bases to your other brands, would you attempt to find <coughs> similar market segments between portfolios or what are your thoughts on the best way to approach this? It's a great question. I think it depends obviously on your brands. Like we have a client that sells ski gear and then high end shoes, right? Um, you can make the argument that there is overlap there, right? Cause if you can afford to ski, you probably can afford high end shoes. You know what I'm saying? I think for you, um, absolutely. Um, there's two ways of going about it. Um, the way that I would first go about it is to look at the data in a siloed fashion. Um, by siloed, I mean store by store. Like here's my ski product line and here's my high end shoe product line and do my initial research. I would then probably try to blend that together. Um, by blending it together, you might actually find that the same customer is in both areas, right? And um, that can be accomplished via Glue Enterprise or what is now called Glue Plus. I hope that answers your question. I tried to keep that one a little bit high level because I could go in many directions with, with that one. Cool. And we've gotten a couple um, pretty simple ones that I'm just responding to in the chat. Um, we did get one more I think we should answer. Can you remind us how to see the percentage of shoppers within segments that account for annual revenue? So that's an important sure. one. So you're going to go to customers segments. And I'm assuming you've already made your segment if it's custom in customer list. After you create your segment, you're going to go to segments. And when you go to segments, you're then going to blow out to a year, right? Because we want to find the past year. And then what you're going to do is you're simply just going to click into the segment that you want to see more information on. And then uh, you'll see the percentage revenue in the past year for that group of people. Cool. Um, I think that answers most of our questions. Lisa just asked for those of us that are really new to Glue, do you have any recommendations on how we can learn more about the platform and benefits that may not be obvious? That's a really great question. We are working on creating a ton of content that answers those exact questions. Um, for anyone who might be on the webinar that is new, I'll include links to all of that new content that we're creating. Um, Mark has been doing these webinars. We have a whole series of Glue Academy videos. We have some new guides that we've been creating. So I'll include links to all of that um, in the follow-up email that I send out afterwards. Um, anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I would say on, on Abby's point, everything Abby said except I'd stress the Glue Academy videos. Um, guys, I've done so many of, I've talked to so many multi-channel companies and it's not that I'm the smartest guy in the world, it's that just through experience, I've learned a lot and I carefully layered those Glue Academy videos in a very particular order to transfer as much unintuitive knowledge upon you as quickly as possible. I've gotten a lot of good feedback from those. I'm also looking for requests on new videos. I have another five lined up. So yeah, um, I would stress the Glue Academy, but also everything that Abby just said. Yeah. Definitely. A couple last questions I see in here. Um, if you guys will, uh, actually, I can look up your email. So I will follow up with you guys um, about kind of just a couple specific one-on-one um, -on -one issues via email, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, but I think that is it for now. We had a great time with you guys. Yeah, always until next month when we do our next, uh, our next webinar. Or I hope that if you are a client or you're looking to sign up, you write in way before next month because a lot of this knowledge is best transferred on a one-on-one -on -one conversation. 
but we very much appreciate your business and look forward to seeing you in a few weeks. Awesome. Thanks so much, guys. Have a great day.